first 90 days was written by Michael Watkins. Michael Watkins is an associate professor of business administration at Harvard Business School, where he does research on leadership and negotiation. In the first 90 days, Harvard Business School professor Michael Watkins presents a roadmap for taking charge in your first 90 days on a new job. The first days in a new position are critical because small differences in your actions can have a huge impact on long-term results. Leaders at all levels are very vulnerable in their first few months in a new job because they lack in-depth knowledge of the challenges they'll face and what it will take to succeed with their new company. Failure to create momentum in the first 90 days virtually guarantees an uphill battle for the rest of an executive's tenure in a job. The first 90 days presents strategies and tools to help you get up to speed faster and achieve more sooner. This summary will show you how to diagnose your situation and understand its challenges and opportunities. You'll also learn how to assess your own strengths and weaknesses, how to quickly establish priorities, and how to manage key relationships that will help you succeed. Promoting yourself doesn't mean self-serving behavior, grandstanding, or hiring a PR firm to tell the world about you. It means mentally preparing yourself to move into your new role by putting the past behind you and getting a running start by working hard to learn all you can about your new position. Because you might not get a smooth transition from one set of job responsibilities to another, it's essential to discipline yourself to make smooth transitions mentally. Do whatever it takes to get into a transition state of mind. Your transition begins the moment you learn you're being considered for a new position, and it ends about 90 days after you begin the job. At the 90-day mark, key people in the organization expect you to be making an impact. For planning purposes, you should use the 90-day mark as an important milestone. It will help you realize that you've got to get things done in that short time frame. If you're fortunate, you may get a month or more between the time you learn you're being considered and your first day on the new job. Use that time to educate yourself about your organization. You've been offered your new position because the people who hired you think you've got what it takes to succeed. You probably do, but it can be disastrous to rely too much on the skills and knowledge that made you successful in the past. You can do a lot to overcome your vulnerabilities, including self-discipline, team building, and getting advice and counsel. You'll have to force yourself to devote time to important activities that you don't enjoy and that might not come naturally. In addition, you must find people in your organization who are skillful in these areas and learn from them. As you advance in your career, there will be changes in advice and counsel you require. With promotions comes the need to get good political counsel. Experienced corporate advisors can help you understand the politics of the organization, which is especially important when you plan to implement change. Usually, when a new leader swerves off course, failure to learn is a factor. There's so much new information to absorb that it's difficult to know where to focus and important signals can be missed or when a new boss focuses too heavily on the technological side of the business, products, customers, technologies, and strategies, critical learning about culture and politics is shortchanged. A leader has to customize his or her approach by learning about the organization's culture and politics. The starting point is to define your learning agenda, ideally before you even formally enter the organization. A learning agenda establishes your learning priorities and consists of a focused set of questions that will guide your inquiry. As you learn more, you'll make conclusions about what is going on and why. Your learning will begin to shift toward fleshing out and testing those conclusions. During your transition, you'll learn from various types of hard data, for example, plans, surveys, press accounts, and industry reports. But to make effective decisions, You'll also need soft information about the organization's strategy, technical capabilities, culture, and politics. 
The only way to obtain this intelligence is to talk to people who know about your situation. Identifying promising sources will make your learning more complete and more efficient. Once you have an idea of what you need to learn and where to seek it, the next step is to understand the best way to learn. Far too many new leaders don't effectively diagnose their situations and tailor their strategies accordingly. Then, because they don't understand the situation, they make unnecessary mistakes. This painful cycle happens because people usually model their transitions on a limited set of experiences. Matching your strategy to your situation requires diagnosing the business situation carefully. Only after you've diagnosed the situation can you act wisely about the challenges of your new job and the opportunities and resources available to you. The four broad types of business situations that new leaders must contend with are startup, turnaround, realignment, and sustaining success, or STARS. These are the defining features of each of the STARS situations. 1. Startup In a startup, you've got to assemble the capabilities, people, funding, and technology, needed to get a new business, product, or project off the ground. 2. Turnaround In a turnaround, you take on a unit or group that is in trouble and work to get it back on track. 3. Realignments Your challenge is to revitalize a unit, product, process, or project that is drifting into trouble. This requires that you reinvent the business. 4. Sustaining Success In a sustaining success situation, you're responsible for preserving the vitality of a successful organization and taking it to the next level. Keep people motivated by inventing a new challenge. An important point is that businesses tend to move predictably from one type of situation to another. Understanding the history of your new organization will help you manage challenges and opportunities. Participants in a startup are usually more excited and hopeful than workers in a troubled company in need of a turnaround. But employees in a startup are typically much less focused on key issues than those in a troubled organization, simply because the startup still lacks vision, strategy, and structures. Therefore, a large part of successful transitioning depends on your ability to transform the prevailing organizational psychology. In startups, where the prevailing mood is often one of excited confusion, your job is to channel that energy into productivity. In turnarounds, you may be dealing with a group of people who are close to despair. It's your job to provide a light at the end of the tunnel. By the end of your transition, you want your boss, your peers, and your subordinates to feel that something new and good is happening. Early wins excite and energize people, build your credibility, and quickly create value for your organization. It's crucial to get early wins, but it's also important to get them the right way. These are the most common traps that afflict new leaders. Failing to focus, not taking the business situation into account, not adjusting to the corporate culture, failing to get wins that matter to your boss, and letting your means undermine your ends. If you achieve impressive results in a way that colleagues think is manipulative, underhanded, or inconsistent with the corporate culture, you're asking for trouble. In the first 90 days, a key goal is to build personal credibility and create organizational momentum. Secure some early wins to leverage your energy and expand the potential scope of your subsequent actions. As you look for ways to create momentum, keep in mind that the actions you take to get early wins should do double duty. Your efforts should, one, be consistent with A-item business priorities. Two, introduce the new patterns of behavior you want to instill in your organization. Armed with an understanding of your A-item priorities and objectives for behavior change, you can now create detailed plans for how you'll secure early wins during your first 90 days and beyond. 
You should think about what you must do in two phases, building credibility in the first 30 days and deciding where you'll focus your efforts to achieve improvements in performance in the following 60 days. Negotiating success means engaging with your new boss to shape the game so you have a good chance of achieving your goals. Negotiate with your boss to establish realistic expectations, reach agreement on the situation, and secure sufficient resources to get things done. When experienced managers are asked about building a productive relationship with a new boss, their observations usually consist of do's and don'ts. Here are six don'ts. Don't trash the past. You must understand the past, but concentrate on assessing current behavior and results. Don't stay away. If you have a boss who doesn't reach out to you, or if your relationship with your boss is uncomfortable, you'll have to reach out yourself. Don't surprise your boss. It's no fun bringing bad news to the boss. The danger that the messenger, you, will be shot is real. But most bosses consider it a greater sin not to report emerging problems early enough. Don't approach your boss only with problems. You don't want to be perceived as bringing nothing but problems for your boss to solve. Give just a few minutes thought to how to address the problem, your role in solving it, and the help you'll need. Don't run down your checklist. There are times when this is appropriate, but it's rarely what your boss needs or wants to hear. Don't try to change the boss. Assume that you're not going to change your boss and adapt to his or her style and idiosyncrasies. There are fundamental do's as well. If you follow them, life with your new boss will be easier. Take 100% responsibility for making the relationship work. Don't expect your boss to reach out or offer the time and support you need. Assume that it's your responsibility to make the relationship work. Clarify mutual expectations early and often. Begin managing expectations right away. It's smart to talk openly about bad news in the beginning and to lower unrealistic expectations. Negotiate timelines for diagnosis and action planning. Buy yourself some time to diagnose the new organization and come up with an action plan. The higher you climb in an organization, the more you assume the role of organizational architect, creating an environment in which others can perform well. No matter how charismatic you are, you can't hope to do much if key elements in your unit are out of alignment. If strategy, structure, systems, and skills are within your purview in your new position, you need to begin to analyze the architecture of your organization and assess alignment among these key elements. You can't hope to do much more than conduct a solid diagnosis and perhaps get started on addressing alignment issues in the first few months but plans to assess the architecture of your group and to begin identifying areas for improvement should be included in your 90-day plan. Begin by thinking of yourself as an architect of your unit or group, because managers typically have limited control over organizational design early in their careers, they learn little about it. It is common for less senior people to complain about misalignments and to wonder aloud why those idiots higher up let obviously dysfunctional arrangements continue. By the time you reach the mid-senior levels of most organizations, however, you're well on your way to becoming one of those idiots. You're well advised to learn something about how to assess and design organizations. To equip your group to achieve its goals, five elements of organizational architecture must work together. 1. Strategy the core approach the organization will use to accomplish its goals. 2. Structure. How people are grouped in units and how their work is coordinated. 3. Systems. The process is used to add value. 4. Skills. The capabilities of the various groups of people in the organization. And 5. Culture. The values, norms, and assumptions that shape behavior. 
Organizations can become misaligned in many ways. One important goal during your first 90 days should be to identify possible misalignments and design a plan to correct them. Too many managers rely on simple fixes to address complicated alignment problems. Be alert to these five all-too-common pitfalls. First, trying to restructure your way out of deeper problems. Resist changing structure until you understand whether restructuring will address the root causes of the problems. 2. Creating structures that are too complex. Although it may look good on paper to create a structure, such as a matrix in which people in different units share accountability, too often the result is bureaucratic paralysis. 3. Automating problem processes. Automating your group's core processes may yield significant gains in productivity, quality, and reliability, but it's a mistake to simply speed up an existing process through technology if the process has serious underlying problems. 4. Making changes for change's sake. New leaders who feel self-imposed pressure to put their stamp on the organization often make changes in strategy or structure before they really understand the business. And 5. Overestimating your group's capacity to absorb strategic shifts. It's difficult for a group to change because of large-scale changes in strategy. Focus on a few vital priorities and make changes gradually if time allows. If you create a high-performance team, you can exert tremendous leverage to create value. If not, you'll face severe difficulties because no leader can hope to achieve ambitious goals on his or her own. Poor personnel choices will usually come back to haunt you. Finding the right people is essential, but it's not enough. Begin by evaluating current team members to decide who will stay and who will have to go. Then create a plan for obtaining new people and moving the people you keep into the right positions without doing too much damage to short-term performance. You still must establish goals, incentives, and performance measures that will propel your team in the desired directions. When it comes to building a winning team, many new leaders stumble. The result may be a delay in reaching the break-even point, or it may be outright derailment. These are some of the traps new leaders fall into. 1. Keeping the existing team too long. Some leaders clean house too quickly, but it's more common to keep people on board too long. 2. Not repairing the airplane. Molding a team is like repairing an airplane in mid-flight. You will not reach your destination if you ignore the necessary repairs. 3. Not working organizational alignment and team restructuring issues in parallel. You can't build your team before reaching clarity about changes in strategy, structure, systems, and skills. 4. Not holding on to good people. Uncertainty about who will and who will not be on the team can lead your best people to look for opportunities elsewhere. 5. Starting team building before the core team is in place. New leaders with a consensus building style often are eager to begin collaborating with their direct reports, but some group members may be leaving. 6. Making implementation-dependent decisions too early. When implementing your plans requires buy-in from your team, you should postpone making decisions until the core members are in place. And 7. Trying to do it all yourself. Find out who can best advise you and help you chart a strategy. You're likely to inherit some good performers, some average ones, and some who simply aren't up to the job. You'll also inherit a group with its own internal dynamics and politics. During your first 30 to 60 days, you must sort out who's who, what roles each individual plays, and how the group has worked together in the past. If your success depends on the support of people outside your direct line of command, it's important to create coalitions to get things done. Influence networks, informal bonds among colleagues, can help you generate support for your ideas and goals. 
It's up to you to build coalitions that will help you achieve your goals. To do so, you'll need an influence strategy. Figure out whom you must influence, select those likely to support and resist your key initiatives, and persuade swing voters to join your side. Sooner or later, you'll need the support of people over whom you'll have no direct authority. You'll need to invest time and effort in building a new base. Identify the key relationships between your group and others. Customers and suppliers, within the company and outside of it, are natural focal points for relationship building. Get your boss to connect you. Ask for a list of ten key people outside your group whom he or she thinks you should get to know. Then set up meetings with them. Consider doing the same when you have new direct reports coming on board. Create priority relationship lists for them and help them make contacts. Also, try to identify the sources of power that give people influence in the organization. The usual sources of power in an organization are expertise, access to information, status, control of resources such as budgets and rewards, and personal loyalty. Eventually, you'll be able to pick out the people who exert heavy influence through formal authority, special expertise, or sheer force of personality. If you can convince these individuals that your goals have merit, broader acceptance of your ideas is likely to follow. Identify your supporters and your opponents.